morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. Today, we have a special guest, Mr. Jeff Gitterman. He is the founder of Gitterman Wealth Management, but he is also a leader in the ESG and sustainable investing field and created um, an investing solution called SMART. SMART stands for Sustainability Metrics Applied to Risk Tolerance. Very important. And you are also the co-host of The Impact TV Show, which airs on FinTech TV as well as Bloomberg TV. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you to the show today is you and I have talked extensively about ESG and the need for scientists in ESG because you constantly promote the need for science. So could you please explain in a, in a simple way why ESG requires more scientists and maybe less um, just finance people? I mean, the intersection of climate and capital is something that is unfortunately not that well understood yet. There are some firms that are focusing on it. We've tried for the past few years in working with the UN to bring together the scientists and the capitalists and explain the risks that are inherent in the markets due to climate change, which is not very well understood at all. Uh, unfortunately, markets are really good at looking at past cycles to predict future events. They're not very good at helping to predict unknown past cycles. And as lots of naysayers like to point out, the earth has been this warm before, but there were no people living on the planet then. They always leave that part out. So we, we desperately need climate scientists in all of our conferences that we host, both virtually and at the UN, we always start off or kick off our conferences with actual scientists um, from NASA and other places, Woodwell, um, some of the premier groups that are working on the intersection of physical risk and uh, transition risk in the capital markets. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you said that um, climate deniers will say, well, the earth's been hotter before. And I, I made the, a grand error in simply saying in response to that, do you mean during the Carboniferous? And their face kind of dropped, they didn't know what I was talking about and I realized, I just made a huge mistake talking down to somebody. So the whole goal is that we talk to each other in an even playing field where it's the science is real, climate change is happening. And another issue we're seeing, you know, in addition to the need for more scientists is climate change and ESG are getting politicized. Like people are fighting over this on the floor. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. I mean, there's, you know, on the far left, there's greenwashing you know, that's certainly occurring on the far right. There's conversations around woke capitalism and somewhere in between those two lies the truth. Um, and I think the politics, I don't want to get into who's right and who's wrong, but, but the politics of really destroying science is unfortunately becoming something that we're constantly having to deal with. And it, there's a very good marketing campaign that's been going on for really decades um, that is just looking to question the science constantly. And, yeah. and it really, it unfortunately, started even back when, when we were fighting you know, tobacco regulations um, and PR firms started working for tobacco companies and, and really attacking the science around whether tobacco was bad. And those same PR firms went to work for the fossil fuel industry after that. And, you know, controversy sells and social yeah. media feeds off of controversial topics of the far left and the far right, even though the majority of the country is well based in the middle. You know, there's 6% left leading liberal, there's 7% far right conservatives and it, social media does a great job at exacerbating that dialogue and not focusing on a healthier dialogue that is somewhere in the middle where 80% of the population of the U.S. really, you know, lands. We do, do you need really think that the, sorry, oh, sorry, Wendy. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. The, um, do you really think that, um, like the banking community really understands ESG and how to implement it? Uh, put it out, um, work with the science and the fact base, you know, banking intrinsically means, you know, money, getting, um, you know, money. How do you monetize uh, whatever the product is or the idea is? And do you really feel like that there's a connection between the two right now? So I, I think 
if I could take a step back for one second, because ESG is really a data set that looks at the effect that the world might have on a company. And I think people often lump that into the climate conversation. And it's really two separate things because the ESG is looking at environmental regulation laws and what impact that might have on a company's performance. It's looking at social movements and how you know labor might be impacted by those social movements and, and certainly governance issues and how well the board is governed in light of a changing environment that could have impacts on the company that you're investing in. And ESG within each industry looks to compare only companies within that industry to how they're performing on metrics that rate those risk factors. Climate, which is really the central focus of TCFD or the IPCC reports coming out of the UN, is much more focused on companies' impacts on the environment and the world. So one is an outward looking in data set, one is an inward looking out data set. And because of Europe and the leadership that they're showing around TCFD adherence and, and other organizations, um, adherences to regulations around carbon emissions and physical risk preparedness, banks are coming along, um, especially large banks that are multinational, because they have to adhere, regardless of the fact that they're an American-based company. If they're operating in Europe, they have to adhere to these new standards. And it quickly looks, at least under the next two years of, of political party that we're in currently, that the U.S. will move towards adherence of European regulation around banking industry and other factors. So banks are taking it super seriously. They are in business to make money and they're dragging their feet as much as they can. Um, you know, sometimes they're talking out of one side of their face about net zero commitments and on the other side, they're financing, you know, coal plants still. Um, so it's, it's a very tricky area that needs regulation and investor um, action. So we, we really need investor activism and regulation to have any movement forward right now. One of the things, because, you, you know, talking about the ESG side of things and the company, you know, generating the data, looking outwards, we are seeing what I like to call unintentional greenwashing, because I, I would like to think people don't intentionally do this. They simply may not know. I'm being really nice. I know this. <laughs> I always play nice. But now with all of these new regulations coming down, we have the SEC getting involved. We've seen Deutsche Bank get raided. We saw Goldman Sachs being investigated. And actually a lot of investors are now saying, well, I don't care about ESG anymore. You know, it's all complete garbage. We're seeing a, a definitely dismantling and change. I mean, even The Economist published an article, I believe on Friday, that said we need to pull the E out of the s &G. Where do you see the future of ESG going? Yeah, the asset management industry has really dived into ESG um, fully. Um, there are companies that are lagging. There are companies that made name changes to funds that shouldn't have been you know, changed. Um, but when you really dig in and look at the top tier asset management firms, especially European-based asset management firms, um, nobody doesn't want more data in the companies that they're reviewing. Um, pretty much every large asset management firm is consuming ESG data at this point. Where it gets tricky is what is the output that you're trying to achieve with that ESG data and how do you market that? And, and that's where greenwashing comes into play because consumers are not savvy enough to really distill a prospectus and find out what is you know the real meat of a, a name. If a fund is named a low carbon fund, and has Exxon and Halliburton as the top two holdings. Is that really what the consumer was trying to get at? I think the SEC is 100% right in what they're focused on right now, which in the asset management industry, they're most focused on, are you doing what you say that you're doing? And, and that is a critical review that was absolutely necessary to come to the industry. There are a lot of great fun companies that are doing what they say that they're doing. And there are a lot that need to get cleaned up and, and they're, you know, 
their their butt cheeks are tight right now. They're they're <laughs> they're nervous after. I mean, Bank of America got fined, and as you said, Deutsche yeah. and, and Goldman have had you know issues as well. So, I think they're moving in the right direction to eliminate a lot of the greenwashing and that needed regulation in play to do that. Um, so we're, we're, we're getting there. I don't think ESG, you know, it's kind of like the horses are out of the gate and there's no getting them back in. Um, everyone understands that this data is material to price, um, but you have to understand how to use the data. I always like liken it to, uh, you could have 10 chefs and they could all have the same ingredients and, and you can have complete slop on one end and you can have the best dish you've ever eaten on the other end. So at the end of the day, you want to know what is this manager doing with the data? Yeah. Um, buying a passive index that uses some ESG scores from a rating agency, I don't think is the intention ultimately of what ESG is for, but no one's going to stop getting the data. It, it's kind of like, I use this example all the time that it's like the GPS of investing. So you used to take a road trip, you had an old map, and it was very stale information about the trip you were about to take. And you could get caught by road closures and traffic and detours and all this stuff that you couldn't avoid. Then all of a sudden, somebody invented a GPS and nobody's running around saying, oh my God, you know, no one wants more data. This is woke driving. Like no one's attacking the GPS community. And that's all ESG is. ESG is a larger data set that gives you information about the companies that you're investing in. And nobody doesn't want that. Um, whether you want a thematic fund that, you know, doesn't own fossil fuel companies or not, well, you know, if you want to consider that woke investing, I'm actually, I'm okay with that. That's a fair, I don't know if it's fair, but but it, at least it's, it's an acceptable, um, subject that you're throwing on something. Someone's making a conscious decision um, to not own fossil fuel companies. But ESG doesn't even do that. ESG looks at fossil fuel companies and evaluates them with the ESG data within industry the same way they do banking or pharmaceutical or healthcare companies. They all get, you know, ESG data. And it would be inconceivable that an investor, if it was explained right to them, would say, no, 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 no. I, I want to use the old map and I want to get stuck in all the detours and traffic. I, I'm, I'm against GPS driver. Just... There's nothing wrong with the too much data, in my opinion. I mean, yeah. background scientist, I live for data. But um, when we talked also about, you know, so ESG and it does need sort of to be um, regulated. We need some updates to how, you know, how we evaluate things. But going back to the climate change, um, you and I, when we spoke, the last heat wave we, you know, that hit the EU, and the EU was well ahead of the United States in all of their initiatives, but that heat wave was devastating and it affected travel, you know, transportation, as well as workers. And um, buildings, they're showing signs of building weaknesses due to the heat, actually. Airports were closed. There were yes. numerous effects. Yeah, and so um, could you, just for the audience, could you tie in that, you know, these physical damages that we were seeing, heat exhaustion, extreme, you know, extreme heat, planes not being able to take off, how this affects the economy overall. Yeah, it's really looking at supply chain issues. So when you uh, evaluate a company as an investor, you want to know where there is supply chain risk. So if you own a company, and, and I think COVID really just shown a spotlight on where supply chain risk can hurt you. If you own a company and all of your distribution, let's say your Coca-Cola is an example, and all of your sugar is being sourced from, you know, one South American country, and mm. there's a devastating heat wave in that South American country that kills the crops, and that's your only place that you're sourcing sugar from, you're in serious trouble. Um, the same thing is true, like in a real estate REIT. If you own a REIT where 70% of your properties are in downtown Houston, which is probably one of the top three single most at-risk flood zones in the United States. You, you don't need more than one or two large storms to see the valuation of your real estate investment trust go down significantly. And all of that data is available. I mean, the, the easiest example to give people is that you can now go on street easy and get a flood risk score for every house in America. 
<clears throat> you can get a flood risk score for every municipal bond in America through RASQ, which is owned by ICE. There, there's significant data available to measure the future risk of flood damage. Then you can look at drought risk. Um, you know, Lake Mead is at the lowest point. I, there's all kinds of, you know, arguments about this publicly that Lake Mead isn't subject to climate change because it was man-made originally when it was first created. But the reality is that there's not enough moisture filling Lake, Re Lake Mead, and that's going to have a devastating effect on our ability to produce crops, to generate water, to water our lawns. I mean, not that that's a necessity, but you can see the trickle down effect of every kind of incident. You can look at a great example is the fires in Northern California. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric was disclosing for years in their ESG data that their risk of fires because of droughts was off the charts compared to any other utility in America. Most active managers using ESG data, over 90% of them didn't hold Pacific Gas and Electric. Every passive index that was ESG screen did hold Pacific Gas and Electric because it was converting the most number of people to renewable energy of any utility in the country. So there's a really clear example of, all right, there was ESG data, but if you didn't read into the data enough, you missed the risks that were inherent. But if you did use the ESG data correctly, you caught the risks and you would have avoided owning it. And now, I mean, I don't know if you watch property insurance, um, but the, trying to get homeowners insurance in oh, yeah, Northern yeah, California closer. is absurd. Um, I have a good it's, friend it's, who lives yeah. in Napa and from 2014 to now, they're 10 x 10 x their cost of homeowners insurance annually. So from 8,000 to somewhere over um, $70,000 a year. Yeah, that's actually, very, that's a very true statement. Um, so my background being in insurance, I do talk to a lot of people that work with wildfire funds and wildfire groups. And the whole question is how can someone even buy a house if you can't get a mortgage, if you can't get you know, the homeowner's insurance? So you can't unless you do full cash and then you have to take the risk. And um, there are many groups actively working on that. Um, Department of Insurance is trying to keep the insurance industry here in California with some of their mandates. But the reality being is an insurance company's for profit. If they're losing money, they're not going to continue to cover something. So we have to find a way to, to mitigate that. Yeah. Are you watching what's happening in Florida? Because the more and more of the companies in Florida that do renters insurance, especially have left the business and the state reinsurance program in Florida is grossly underfunded. They're probably 50% underfunded and it would only take one major hurricane in Florida right now to bankrupt the state's reinsurance yeah. fund. Wow. Yeah, it's not good. Um, a lot of people are talking about things called captive insurance policies. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working with some groups and, and that needs to be handled by municipalities. And I keep telling them just remove the insurance carriers out of the equation for now. They're not going to take the risk. Handle it with municipalities, cities, states, counties, whatever. Get that risk handled, meaning through mitigation strategy, and then the insurance company could maybe come back in on an excess layer. Um, so there's a lot of people, you know, talking, we need more doing. <laughs> so hopefully that will change. Um, but to tie everything together before I let you go, Jeff, um, I wanted to talk with climate change and excess heat. Workers, people are, you know, if you see people working outdoors, this, ex you know, extreme heat we're now experiencing will kill people. It will harm them and you know that's going to affect our economy as well yeah i mean we're already seeing you know certainly in the northwest we had the heat wave last year there were i think close to 800 people passed because of excess heat we're seeing across europe right now yeah. significant deaths um, what people miss a lot is that heat causes more deaths annually than any other major climate events so more than hurricanes tornadoes um floods, any kind of um, natural disaster, heat is the worst. And the human body can only handle, I, I think, wet bulb temperatures are in the 95 degree um, uh, side when you combine heat and humidity at a certain point. And then even in shade, the body can't um, adjust uh, 
for very long at all. So yeah. we'll be dealing with this. I, I don't know if you follow Spencer Glendon's work, but Spencer Glendon does heat maps that are available for free. And mm -hmm. you can literally follow uh, projections of where our places will be uninhabitable. So by, I think 2050, Disney World has to be closed almost 50 days a year due, due to excessive heat, which Again, you know, this does tie a nice bow back around because when you ask the question, how do you interpret climate through a lens of capital? Well, if you have to do projections on the profitability of Disney World, it's going to be pretty important to know that they can't operate probably on average 50 days a year in the next 15, 20 years um, at one of their most profitable enterprises. So it's it's significant, but I like to remind people the climate models have been almost dead on accurate for the last 30 years or so. They get more accurate every year. And the ability to predict risk models over time is getting easier and easier to do. But what climate models don't ever do is they don't point to local um, issues. So if you have a heat wave you know, in London, the climate models predict that it's a possibility in the future, but they're not going to tell you in 2022 you're going to have a heat wave in London. I mean, that's weather yeah. that's exasperated, exacerbated, sorry, by climate issues. Um, so people have to understand that, you know, we have to agree on the language that we're talking about. All heat that's waves really, yeah. keep getting worse and worse. Droughts will get worse. Storms will get bigger. And this is the unfortunate future that is baked in for the next few decades, regardless of how much action we take now. Yeah, we have to learn to adapt pretty quickly. But I, you know, going back to one of your first statements is we got to meet in the middle. Yeah. We have to start talking to each other and actually agreeing on things and just get moving. No more fighting on the floor. Um, but before I let you, so as we wrap up, could you please tell people one, how to find you? and resources to, for people to learn more about ESG, because I believe you offer a program. Yeah, so it depends on who it's for, but GittermanWealth.com or GittermanAsset.com, Gitterman Wealth for Individual Investors, GittermanAsset.com for Institutional Investors. Uh, we have climate science data on our sites. We have videos, we have reports. They're all available for free. They can all be downloaded. And investment professionals can check out our course uh, that I do. Um, with Paul Ellis at riachannel.com. And the RIA channel is fantastic. I've watched a couple of videos. Thank you me. guys are spot on on that information. And it's easily understood even for someone like me. <laughs> Don't sell yourself short, Wendy. You're the rock doctor. <laughs> I am the rock doctor. So thank you, Jeff, for your time. This has been spectacular knowledge. And um, hopefully we'll see you again in the near future because this is just going to continue to evolve. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I'm Wendy Nystrom with Environmental Social Justice with my co-host, Ms. Joy Langford, and our guest, Jeff Gitterman. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.